Good morning, everyone. Hi there, I'm Katie Callow Wright, Executive Vice President of the University, and I am delighted to welcome you to this celebration in honor of John Boyer. I have been fortunate enough to work alongside John in a variety of roles during my time at the university. And as you know, he has proved to be a passionate and steadfast champion of the college for each and every day of his 30 plus years as dean. Through changing administrations and a shifting higher education landscape and significant societal challenges, John's clear-eyed vision for the ways in which the college should grow and change never wavered. Today we come together to explore and celebrate John's transformative contributions to the University of Chicago through the perspective of some of the colleagues who worked with him most closely over the years. To moderate our first panel this morning, I am pleased to introduce the university's newly appointed provost, Kate Baker. I'm delighted to be here with you today, and I think I'd like to invite our panelists to come to the stage as I introduce them, because I know we want to have plenty of time to make sure that we get to your questions as well as all of the questions I have. So first, I'd like to introduce people who need no introduction, of course, President Oliver Sados. Uh, as you know, he's president of the University of Chicago, also a, a a distinguished chemist and a long career in academia, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the stage, and Tom Rosenbaum, who is currently president of the California Institute of Technology and also uh, a distinguished expert on quantum mechanical nature of nature of materials. Uh, I'd like to introduce David Green. Where are you here? Please come on up. President of Colby College. And of course, before his presidency, he served as the executive vice president of the University of Chicago. And Tom Rosenbaum, before his presidency, served as provost of the University of Chicago. Uh, Don Randall, please come on up, served as the 12th president of the University of Chicago from 2000 through 2006 and he led efforts to strengthen the humanities and arts on campus. And Kai Lee, please join us on stage, the Executive Vice President for Strategic Initi Initiatives at the university. Um, and her research area is on the, on the membrane, sorry, her research area is membrane biophysics. Just showing my lack of familiarity with the vast expertise on the stage, and I mentioned those areas of expertise in part to show that these are very distinguished panelists in addition to their leadership roles at the University of Chicago, which are of course the most important thing they've ever done. Um, so with that introduction, I know that, uh, is this still working? Yes, great. I want to jump straight into questions because I know how important each of these folks has been in partnering with John Boyer and how much they can tell us about the way the college has evolved over the last 30 plus years and all of the changes that apply to not only the curriculum, but how we think about student life, how we address an evolving, wonderful change in the student population that we are seeing out in the world and here at the University of Chicago, and how instrumental John has been in changing the way that the University of Chicago thinks about our college students and the enduring principles that haven't changed at all over time and that have been manifest in such enduring ways here at the university. So I would like to start uh, just by turning to maybe some of you who have known John for a long time. And Tom, I know you have experience with John both as a leader of the college, but also as a parent yourself. And how has your experience of the college uh, evolved in those two perspectives? Uh, well, well, thank you, Kate. And it's such a pleasure to be back home. Uh, <laughs> I, um, um, and, and you're quite right. I, I think I may have learned more about the college uh, having my sons go through the college than as provost. Um, and, you know, for example, why do the washing machines in the basement at BJ require so many quarters? Yeah. <laughs> my main contribution to my son's education was to provide them with quarters. Uh, <laughs> But, but maybe there are two quick vignettes before I get to my uh, interactions with uh, John as provost. 
uh, about our kids. So my older son had no intention of coming to the University of Chicago. So this was 2008, he was admitted. And you know, Kathy and I said, you, you know, you should go visit the various places and see what you think about them. So he came here for accepted students day, whatever it's called. And he s spent the whole night arguing about Hegel and Marx on the main quad. And he said, this is the place I'm coming. <laughs> so you know, it tells you about the kind of ethos that was here. But of course, under John's leadership, those characteristics were just amplified. And more people knew about it. We drew much more broadly from the general population. I think, you know, not to be too unkind, but 30 years ago, if you were a student and you didn't know about the University of Chicago, it was your problem, not our problem. <laughs> But that is, that was the attitude, but that has just changed completely. And of course, what the University of Chicago has to offer is just spectacular. Uh, the core, of course, which John was a main proponent for and, and revamped and revitalized, uh, I saw its effects through our kids. So our younger son, I think, took mind or, or one of them. And, uh, um, and then he took various courses from Larry McInerney. And I think about two weeks in, uh, he wrote a five-page paper. And he got back 12 pages of comments. <laughs> <laughs> I said, this is it. This is exactly what we're trying to teach. You know, I mean, this is a pretty big place. Um, and yet, look at the individual attention. So, and, and I've really had a lot of pleasure watching the core develop the much broader connections to the assets of the university in terms of the professional schools. I know, Kate, that you've been involved in that as well through Harris. Uh, and, and, and I think the opportunities we offer our students, your students, are, are, are just extraordinary. <laughs> I have to make sure I remember <laughs> which place I'm in. They're still, still yours, Tom. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so this notion of teaching, I, I think, the most animated I would ever see John was when a letter would go out to a faculty member, an appointment letter, after it had been approved. And if for some reason there was an arrangement where that faculty member was not explicitly required uh, to teach in the core. And we mostly fix those. I think at the 99% level. Um, but, but I think it's a reflection of the view of what the college is bringing and its place in the university that, yes, these are scholars of incredible distinction, uh, and I'm surrounded by many of them here, um, but they have a real obligation and devotion uh, to the undergraduate program. And, and John had a clarion call for that. The, la the last vignette I, I, I will mention um, is, that of course, the college expanded quite a bit. I arrived here in 1983. There were 2,800 students in the college. Uh, the joke I make is that for, for any faculty member, the ideal size of the college is the size it was when you arrived. Uh, but it is a much better place, and, uh, and, and uh, I think we've adapted uh, to the increase in, in, in size enormously well. But of course, there weren't enough residences uh, for the students. And John just pushed this. I don't know how many conversations we had about the necessity to be able not to put our students into luxury uh, uh, um, appurtenances, but rather to be able uh, to treat them in a way that they're really integrated into the full part of the university life. And the one disappointment I had, I must say, is that every time we would build one, John would admit a thousand more students, we'd be back to square one. <laughs> <laughs> but all good. Well, I, and Tom, I think three provosts on this panel can attest to the nature of the letters that one might get if yeah. one were to inappropriately characterize a new professor's <laughs> teaching load. <laughs> so some, some values endure. And, and maybe, Don, can I turn to you to talk about some of those changes that Tom highlighted in terms of the growth of the college and the evolution of the core. And these, we can see now, are wonderful features. but. Very few things are without controversy in academia. And, and how have you experienced John's role in shepherding through something as complex as that? It being the 
University of Chicago, of course, nothing that you would change significantly would be without controversy mm -hmm. and debate. Um, but the simple fact is that if you were to poll the professoriate across the nation and ask them each to write you two sentences about the University of Chicago, they would all know how to do it, and those pairs of sentences would be a lot alike. It would be about this, the intellectual spirit, the spirit of debate, uh, so forth, that you all know very well. John's gift was to see the core, undergraduate education in general, change uh, in ways that it probably needed to change while not losing sight of what was its essential, the university's essential character. That is how to change the way undergraduates or what undergraduates were going to study um, without giving up or giving in on any part of its major franchise. Um, only at the University of Chicago, of course, would the students rise up in arms because requirements were being reduced. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't easy to manage through that. But if I would name two qualities that John has that got him through and us all through all of this, it's stamina and patience. Uh, the ability to take the long view and stick with it. Uh, John had a vision not only for the college, but of course by implication it was a vision for the university as well. Um, and part of what you have to bear in mind there is not unlike what Tom said, for alumni, every alumnus or alumna thinks that undergraduate education should today be exactly the way it was when they were students. Um, and so dealing with alumni who were wedded to a certain way of doing things while at the same time persevering in moving it in a different direction, um, that stamina and patience was what uh, enabled John to do what he did. But in transforming the college, of course, we transformed the university. Uh, it's not the university that Harper founded. Uh, and it's not the university that Hutchins presided over either. Uh, any history of higher education in America will tell you that there were at least two universities in particular that were founded on the German model of research and graduate education. That's Chicago and Johns Hopkins. Uh, and that meant a small college uh, in which um, I used to like to think that Every student, by virtue of the smaller size of the college and the larger graduate programs, every student in the college would have to know on arrival here that this was a place about generating new ideas. You couldn't miss that fact if you were an undergraduate. Uh, and so that was one of the things that we had to hang on to even as various things about the core changed and as the size of the undergraduate <coughs> body changed substantially. So yes. We need to respect and cherish our, you'll pardon the expression, brand, uh, which is one of a kind. No other university in the country has anything like it. I don't know. Maybe West Point has a strong brand, too. I mean, uh, it's just, maybe they're not unrelated, you know. <laughs> um, so how to see the university oh boy. to new times while cherishing what it stands for and cherishing its values. That was the great aim. And in that, as I say, John had enormous patience and stamina. Well, and, and Don, you talked about how important the college is, of course, for our college students, but also for the university as a whole and the crucial role that it'll play in the trajectory of the university going forward. And maybe I can turn to Paul to talk about the ways that the transformed and thriving college fits into the future of the university. Well, well thank you. Well, let me start by um, thanking John right now for how, um, how he continues to have an inventive spirit and an experimental spirit. So 
Of course, I en encountered John immediately when it was announced I would be becoming president, and it may maybe many of you have heard me say, uh, you know, we had a, a, an early Zoom call. It was really a very, uh, you know, wonderful during COVID, wonderful call, and then the next day, you know, on my doorstep was this big box of books, um, and <laughs> and um, that was great, and. Uh, <laughs> No, it was, and and actually, uh, what I will say since then has been, um, you know, I've been getting to um, um, work with John in the following mode. Um, I'll, I'll often we're going to meet, you know, in a week or so. I'll, I'll I'll share a topic that's very much on my mind, and uh, John will come to the meeting with a little booklet. And the booklet is some, you know, maybe it's Chicago Studies, uh, the history of how it uh, developed and what it's meant, or maybe it's something about um, how we have uh, tried to quantitatively assess students over the years, and, and, and then he'll, he'll bring that. Um, and and I, I, I took to, at a certain point, trying to um, go back. I have a a section of my office with these, by the way. It's, it's a, and they're good. And, and you know, I, at one point I became suspicious and thought, you know, I bet all this stuff is in these, um, in his big history. And if I just go kind of poking through the big history, he's just pulling these things out. And I, but no, this is not the case. These are all uh, self-contained, thoughtful pieces that have been uh, developed over time that really deeply go into the hard issues they go deeply into the hard issues of the college. They're data-driven. They have history in them, of course. Um, and they go back always to the principles of, of what the college is. But they also expose often the shortcomings. And um, I think that's what's so remarkable. Um, early in our conversations, he pointed out a couple of examples where there's so much more to do. Uh, even as we t celebrate all the things that have been accomplished. Uh, how, how to help young people to get a grounding in fundamental ways of thinking, but then to continue to learn is not something that we'll ever completely finish. And John continues to embody that early on. Uh, he was thinking very hard about um, the challenges of the introductory parts of the STEM uh, curriculum and thinking that there were many shortcomings there that were not succeeding, for example, um, in bringing in the full diversity of student population that has an interest. Many students are coming wanting at the early stages to be in that, and they're not, they're not, they're, they don't end up continuing in it. They end up shifting to other places. That's a failure in, in some ways, and, and John had lots of ideas about how to create new learning environments but what was so instructive to me, and I, I continue to see it every time we interact, is that he was willing to run some experiments. I like to run experiments too. You know, he was going to run a few experiments to see what they did, and then amplify the ones that seem to really be doing well, and kind of move on from the ones that don't. And and um, that's an incredible gift to all of us. And I know that um, uh, we'll will keep that method. The, the other thing I've learned a lot from him about, of course, the grounding in history, looking at what these questions have been in the past, but also um, a kind of experimental approach to how to get things done. <laughs> Not just to what we want to get done. You know, this is not uh, fully uh, working optimally. We can get better at this. We can, re you know, we can do better in education. But also, what are the ways in which uh, we'll be able to bring the community of people together here to get something done? What are the smart ways of doing that? And, and as I'm sure all of you appreciate, those can be very complex issues. You described the core uh, uh, struggles. Uh, what's remarkable to me is how often it seems that things that would be quite difficult um, actually end up kind of moving along fairly smoothly. <laughs> because I think John has learned the techniques of how to, you know, do a small experiment somewhere, get the results, build a little consensus around it locally, and then scale it up and get it to go, and so on. And so, you know, it's kind of a, almost a master class from John in how to make things happen 
in a place that's um, experimental but also has to operate with, uh, with consensus or with a, a deep appreciation of, amongst many people for why something that's new makes sense. So those are a few of the things I think are gifts to us, which as we look to the next stage, we'll just bear in mind I think, you know, this notion that there's still lots to do here, but everything that we've been given and built is a base to operate from and do new things. So, so John, I just want to thank you for that. Well, uh, you've all described and, and alluded to the importance of humanities, social sciences, sciences in coming together in the way that we think about teaching students to think about the future problems that they're going to encounter, which could be things we haven't conceived of when they're taking their classes. And David, let me turn to you um, to get your thoughts on how the teaching experience here prepares students especially well for an uncertain future world. Yeah, thank you and good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Although I didn't attend the University of Chicago, this is definitely where I got my education. There's no <laughs> doubt about that and all of this. The only thing I'm concerned about this morning is we're talking about John in the past tense. It's feeling a bit like a eulogy and he's yeah. looking <laughs> awfully let's, healthy let's sitting in front of me <laughs> right now. So, and it's just great to be able to celebrate what John did. And I think that this conversation about the values of the university are so important. And what Don said I think is really critical because this, this idea that the values remain the same here, but the university is always shifting and changing. Can you imagine if we were still Hutchins College? I mean, it would just be irrelevant at this time, right? If, these, if the different changes that hadn't come into place over the last few decades, if you think about the commitment to the arts that the university has now that it hadn't had previously, for example, Seeing Matt Terrell here and thinking about the, all the moves in, um, in, in thinking about molecular engineering, which Tom played such a huge role in as well. And you can sort of go through, think about data science, how computer science has changed at the university over the last decade. The integration of many of the programs from the professional and, um, and graduate programs that have helped to animate the undergraduate program, huge difference. But one of the things I think that John is responsible for in his um, mostly subtle but kind of machine politics kind of way that only <laughs> John could do. And this is a city that knows something about that and John can compete with the best of them on that, is to think about how to actually integrate a really interesting set of experiences that help to enrich the education, that help to make students better and more engaged students and for them to ask different questions in the classroom and then to be able to take those, everything that they're learning in the classroom and then try them out in a whole variety of settings, whether it's global settings and how fitting last night, thinking about John's role in, in the global programs and how he'll always be remembered for that. But thinking again about all of the things, the Chicago careers and the Metcalf internships, these things have really transformed the education, not just, not just the opportunities for students, which are absolutely true in all of this, but making sure that students begin to kind of understand how do they actually take everything that they're learning and make sense of it in a number of different contexts. And that's what ultimately helps to have things really stick and have them engaged and think in a more deep way about these issues. So I think that's true from the kind of nature of the residential experience and how that's changed over time to everything that's been done from civic engagement and thinking about the deep connection of the university into the city of Chicago right, removing the moat around the university over the last 25 years and more, a huge deal in seeing how this university can be a major part of the fabric of this urban environment and have a huge impact on it and be impacted by it in true partnership in all of this. And having students at the college level play a role in that and for them to get that first taste of it by riding around on a bike with John throughout the city is something else. <laughs> But it's actually many of these experiential pieces that tie into the deep learning that happens. I think that's one of the things that has really changed the nature of the, of the university as a whole. And I think it's always going to be a hallmark of John's career and what he did here. And picking up on, on some of the themes that you've just elevated in terms of the things that accompany the curriculum, which is obviously at the heart of what we're doing at the college, but making sure that students are well prepared and feel confident that they're well prepared for their futures. Kai, I would love to turn to you and get your thoughts on some of the transformative changes in 
career advancement in opportunities to experience education abroad in all of the enriching things that have also developed alongside the evolution of the college. So it's really remarkable the, the evolution of the career development, the existence of study abroad, and really how you integrate the civilization studies um, into all these study abroad programs. So Metcalf Fellowship that was mentioned earlier is celebrating its 25th anniversary. It started off as an experiment, as a pilot of, oh, you know, we want to have 100 at that point. And then a few years later, I talked to John, well, you know, we aim to have 500, and then became 1,000. <laughs> and now we're offering over 4,000 of such experiences, either longer, shorter, but experiences not just in the US, but abroad as well, for the student to really try it out as part of the education and put their knowledge to work in a different place in the summer to actually absorb all the things that they could. And so that is really transformative in terms of how they would be able to focus on their study here, knowing that they would have the opportunity in the summer to have these type of experiences that would advance their career or, or would help them actually think about their career path. Another thing I've mentioned already is a study abroad. So I work closely uh, with John through the campus in Hong Kong. And for five years, we launched this um, study abroad as uncivilization studies, one quarter in the spring on colonization, right? You know, of all places in Hong Kong, you have it in the classroom, and then you walk out and you can really learn and breathe and understand how the process has actually taken hold and taken place in Hong Kong. And that has been really incredible. So I, I really look forward to getting that program back and running uh, in Hong Kong as well. So one thing I want to mention is that John is very subtle, um, but he's always pushing and looking out for student success. So another experiment that I had with him went back to 2007 uh, as a faculty member, and chemistry is a sort of gateway course uh, for everyone who wants to be pre-med and go into the sciences. And John meticulously sort of looked at the data of when students decided to move away uh, from the pre-med career and they just sort of started talking to us. And through a really collaborative process, we put in place two very important projects. One is called CLIC, which is Collaborative Learning in Chemistry. And this is a peer instruction learning to help students understand what is going on and how to sort of, you know, break down a complex problem through peer learning. But we also notice that some of the students are very, very smart, but because of their um, background in high school, their preparation before they come to the University of Chicago, if we go at light speed on the normal track that we have, there's no way for them to catch up. And so through a two years, very patient process, we put in place what we call now introductory chemistry, which I taught along with two colleagues for two experimental years from 2009 to 2011. And that really started to provide the groundwork for us to think about how best to serve our student population to ensure that we're not really lowering the standard, but really bringing them up so they can merge with the rest of the students who might have a better training in the background. And all along, John has been sort of, you know, at the background, looking at us, looking at the data and the outcome, and really pushing these experiments to go forward. And finally, I um, want to talk about the residential college. If you look back, the colleges, the, um, the, the residential hall that has been opened, half of the students who are living in places open under John's you know, leadership. And so you, we have sort of counting backwards, I think, Woodlawn and North and Grand Grosman, Grossman. And then, um, and, and you, can, you can imagine the type of life that they have in the classroom continues in this residential hall. So, so one very poignant point is that during COVID uh, in the spring quarter of 2020, when people are in different places and they cannot be here, so when we're planning for the start of the fall quarter, 
What John and other experiment was to really play students in the same dorm, taking the same Hume sequence, so that they can continue the classroom discussion because they could not go to the residential hall and visit their friends uh, who is in a different residential hall to continue those discussion and provide that intellectual environment, not only in the classroom, but going back into the dormitory as well. So thank you for all your innovative ideas to really bring learning as a holistic experience for our students here. And what a wonderful way to encapsulate the intellectual environment that spills over from the classroom to a student's whole experience mm -hmm. during the time here. And David also mentioned engagement with the city and how uh, we've become a university much more integrated with our neighborhoods and encouraging students to bring that life to the community and to draw the intellectual um, engagement with the community into their studies. And I throw it to the panel to talk about the role of being here in Chicago and the ways that our students have now to engage with our neighborhood and to bridge the gap between the, the life of the mind that they live in their room and life outside. I'll call on someone if I have. The bike ride is. Actually, <laughs> I, I recommend the bike ride if you haven't done it. I, I imagine you know, sticking with the present tense version of things. I, I, I hope you know, John, you're going to continue doing the bike rides. I've been on it and it's excellent. But um, I, I will say that, I mean, my what I've learned is that John, with other people who I see here in the room, have really thought of um, the what it means for the university to be in Chicago for the undergraduate student experience in a very deep way. And um, it includes so many aspects of uh, how their studies can, in, can be enriched by the presence of the university in Chicago. Uh, but it also is a, a, a strong sense of uh, Chicago as potentially being, and being actually an incredible town for a young person to be in. <laughs> the full sense of what the, the culture uh, of the whole city offers, as well as what's nearby us here on the south side. John is a, uh, really uh, has uh, continued to be a strong advocate for that. And I, I see it in so many different programs that we have that allow students to have uh, Metcalf experiences and uh, uh, many students doing their um, undergraduate um, thesis on topics that relate to Chicago and so on. It's just a very rich set of activities there. And um, so I, I think it really makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I jump in on just for thinking about the way that the university has approached this issue with the city is distinctive, if not unique, in terms of the breadth and, and scope of the work, thinking about how to leverage the intellectual resources of the university for the betterment of the city. So in fields like education, where now the University of Chicago has had a huge impact in the city of Chicago. Think about the arts and the work that's been done in the arts across the city, things like the crime lab overall. Mm -hmm. And you can just keep going on with these, right? So taking, you know, as one way of thinking about it, thinking about we've got extraordinary intellectual resources, how can those improve the city? How can we be in partnership with the city on those? But then thinking more broadly about the very nature of the fabric of this neighborhood and beyond, and how can that change? One of the most heartwarming things for me over the last two days coming down here was both times the taxi driver saying to me, there's no area in the, in the city of Chicago that has changed more for the better than this Hyde Park area. I love that. And it's true, when you come down here, the change is really dramatic, whether you're going south of the university, if you're going north of the university, and even um, a bit to the west of the university. So I think that kind of change and everything that was done from 53rd Street to the neighborhoods that are around here to this part of the campus that we're sitting on right now, that 15 years ago looked very different from where it is at this moment, and a very intentional approach to doing everything you can to make sure that the architecture and the whole planning for this campus is designed to actually invite people in, not keep people out. I'll tell you one sort of funny story. When we were um, designing, we had a design competition for the residence hall. I don't know what you call it. What's the Genie Gang building called now, John? North. Campus North. Campus North. It needs a new name. So <laughs> camp, Campus North, when we were designing that, that building, we had 
you have five great architectural firms come in and, and we said, you know, it really had to be a building that didn't, that, that allowed people to kind of come in, that connected people into the university. And so we had this star architect um, who was from Copenhagen and we said, you know, everything about it has to be porous. And he came in with a design that was, uh, he used the, he put up a slide and it was called Circling the Wagons and it was an old picture of like the, the old west with the wagons and he designed a building that was just like that. It was almost like the Pentagon, you know, it was completely impervious, nothing could be done, no one could ever get in, you know, it was, it was uh, just unbelievable. And, but Jeannie Gang, who designed that, actually opened up that building for people to be able to walk through in all kinds of ways and to make it very different. And it's the same thing with the Logan Center, really, because Todd and Billy did an amazing job on that building. But one of the things that they kept doing, which was basically putting the back to the south side of Chicago and not having that tower, which is a, an exquisite tower, be actually welcoming. It was sort of the monolith there. And then if you looked at it from the north and from the university, you had this kind of elegant design. And fighting that, you know, always fighting those things and keeping on them and making sure that this is a place that is actually in every piece, whether it's our intellectual resources, whether it's in the campus planning, whether it's the engagement in the broader community, is really focused on that. Now, just the last thing I'll say that it was just, I think one of the things that the university did so well was to think about how can you help small businesses in this area thrive? There's an enormous spending power in this university and being able to start to think in a very structured way about how you can engage in this community, women and minority owned businesses, for example, small businesses across the south side of Chicago, can they benefit from being here? Can they get part of the purchasing power here? And developing a whole structure around that completely changes the nature of the way that people begin to see this university and benefit from it in a really structured way. All of those moves together, I think I've, I've never seen another university that's taken things on in such a kind of comprehensive and thoughtful way as this university did. Well, I'd love to pick up on your, your uh, pointing to the arts and the, the wonderful spaces that we have for that and thinking about how students are able to engage in arts practice as well as, you know, arts in the classroom. And what have been some of the advances in investments and opportunities for students in the arts and arts practice? I don't know if anybody would like to speak to that. Well, one of the things about the relationship of the arts at the University of Chicago <clears throat> derives from this, from its foundation as a German research university. Uh, and to this day in Germany, um, music performance is taught in separate institutions, Musikhochschule, as opposed to the universities, which is where uh, musicology or music history, Musikwissenschaft is taught. And so Chicago hasn't entirely shed that. I mean, it was a long time before the music department was really engaged in enabling kids to perform, to take lessons, to actually get academic credit for making music as well as studying it. So uh, that's one of the respects in which uh, the university needed to change uh, and to change away from its founding model. I think with the development of, of like Dover, right? So there's the Department of Visual Arts and then students get engaged in various type of art practices. And we also have been, and, and, and Paul can speak more to it, in terms of having art practice as a bigger emphasis to allow students to have a bigger opportunity to really experience the arts. There are other areas of sort of media and art media. That's also another new development um, in the college as well. So there are various type of new innovative uh, ideas of sort of diversifying the curriculum to allow students have a much broader art uh, exposure and experience. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, just, I think uh, I mean, so much has been built here in the arts, but the one thing that we do know, if we look in the spirit of John, if we just try to look at the data that we have, um, it's that the demand for um, arts instruction is just through the roof. We can't even come close to meeting the interests of students. And I think that's because all of the characteristics 
that lead our students to be such curious people, people who really want to understand the world around them. They ask lots of really you know, great questions. They're, they're, they're thinkers in that way. But they also have a deep creative impulse, and they want they want to exercise that, and and they find that uh, you know uh, amplified in their um, in their experiences in the arts, both the uh, scholarly study of the arts and in the actual practice of it. And so I you know there's a there's a great deal of demand uh, on the part of students to do more there. So that's one thing to say. But the second is, you know, thinking about these evolutions of the university. The extent to which, for example, if we look at it as a model, that the university had um, remarkable uh, physical sciences and biological sciences, but wasn't necessarily able as much to, to bring that into the world of engineering, but through molecular engineering found a language for doing that that I think has been deeply resonant. It's a new framing of how to think about that area. And it brings our university into partnership with the society around it in really important ways. There's something like that going on right now in our arts, uh, where we have enormous uh, uh, capacity in the arts and the humanities and throughout the whole university in this dimension. Uh, but, but how we connect it uh, to what's happening in the practice of arts is still developing. And when we have faculty here who are helping us right now to think about that and how to, how, to, how to build on it, I view that as being very much in the spirit of how John has been helping us um, over time uh, to continue to, to evolve as an institution, keeping some of our core principles, but learning to make these connections in different ways. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a spillover influence of the core here in, in, in a funny way, in that, as Don, you were talking about music theory, and then we've hired a number of composers and some mm -hmm. music composition, and that connection and the full expression, looking at the problem from very different perspectives, having people interact. And of course, the students are a big part of that. Uh, there are a number of courses that intersect the arts and uh, sciences, mm -hmm. and putting together students who are studying the arts with students who are studying the sciences and have them work together on projects. And, and that works at a place of the University of Chicago because when the students come in for their first two years, this is the kind of learning and the kind of inquiry that they're exposed to. And uh, I think then you see the, the tendrils extend out. And so the influence of the college and the, and the first two years, I think, is a profound one, even as we think, as you say, Paul, about how do we reorganize right. our approach? What are the languages we develop uh, for expressing the arts, for studying the arts? And, yeah. uh, so I think there are things that University of Chicago can do that no other place can do. It's also true, I think, with this generation of students, they're, they're brilliant in so many ways. And they're, they can, the core and others give them a chance to be really deep thinkers, but they also want to be makers. Absolutely. And that creative spirit that's in them and that desire to do something that is tangible and real is really palpable. And I just think, you know, for, and it's important for us to feed that, I think, and to be, make sure that they have that opportunity, no matter their field that they're, that they're in. But it would also be true that the ability of the university to attract the most talented students from around the world would be severely diminished were that not the case here right now. And that's a really fundamental shift, even over the last 10 or 20 years yeah. in the way the students approach their education, and an exciting one, I think. Mm -hmm. I just want to build on one thing, Tom, that you were just saying, because it is also something that I, I've heard so many times in such wonderful ways um, from John, which is the design of the university with the divisional structure for the graduate programs and for in the schools, and then the college as being this common enterprise which is something that uh, John has paid enormous attention to recruiting faculty into teaching in the college and to bringing together a community who will really think about what should the core be like, how can we make it excellent, how can we make the subsequent parts of the experience for students really, really deep. Um, the extent to which that structure especially as it got larger, has become 
a vast unifying force and a place where uh, experimentation and collaboration between faculty can emerge. You know, that's something that John has been passionate about, and I just, I, you know, seeing it uh, coming back to the university from a place that didn't have a structure like that, I just see its power every day how, you know, and, and it's an important thing for us to just reflect on how important the fact that the college is this common enterprise of the entire uh, university, what, what an impact that has on us and, and you know, to, to continue um, to be strong advocates for that because it's what helps us get these kinds of new developments mm -hmm. uh, to happen is, is, is that, um, that mm -hmm. sense of a, uh, that this is a place where we could invent new things. That uh, is a point that's worth uh, bearing down on a little bit. Um, when it comes to John's patience and stamina, it has been called on, I think, in an extraordinary <laughs> way by the structure of the university, which is quite idiosyncratic, if you want to get down to it. So here is the dean of the college who doesn't own any faculty members. He has no sticks and not many carrots to get people to do stuff. And so it really is a question of moving around and trying to build consensus and so forth. And I, if I think back about my days as dean of arts and sciences at Cornell, I owned the faculty and I was responsible for the curriculum. And so, Mr. Department Chair, you'd like an extra line to do this or that. Well, what's your contribution to undergraduate education? That decision took place in one room. Uh, whereas here, you have these divisional deans and you have uh, <laughs> sort of complicated relationships among them. And that required some considerable diplomatic talent to be sure, but also this kind of steady as she goes patience and <laughs> endurance uh, to get it to happen. <laughs> but if, if I may add that under John, instead of just leveraging the really great resources in each of the divisions, he actually pulled in all the schools to mm -hmm the okay. college and so that our undergrad can actually experience the teaching, the learning, and also learning with graduate students in some cases. Um, and so that really enriched the experience. Mm -hmm. So that is a <coughs> remarkable achievement. And just to say, you know, in my visits around the um, schools, the faculty there really enjoy teaching the undergraduates. It's a, it's, it, for them, it's a highlight because of the, um, just the sheer, um, uh, talent, uh, depth, and exuberance of the students. You know, it's really felt by the faculty in the schools. Yeah. And that, that's an extraordinary accomplishment to have grown the college in size while not only not eroding the quality of the students, but having ever increasing talent pools and drive and remarkable people coming to the university while getting more and more of them here. And several of you have alluded to um, things that the college has done, uh, thanks to John, that open doors to people who might not otherwise have been able to come or thought of coming or thought of uh, the University of Chicago as a place for them. And the Odyssey program is, is clearly a flagship enterprise to bring all sorts of people who would have faced barriers into the University of Chicago's talent pool and, and make sure that we're drawing on the breadth of talent across the world. And I wonder if any of you could speak to uh, both how that program has flourished and also, Kai, you alluded to the thoughtfulness that the college has taken to make sure that people coming from very different places in all senses of that word can come and thrive here and that the, the resources and supports are here to not only get them in and get the finances, but make sure that they have what they need to really thrive in the environment. Well, I really think that both opening the doors wider and expanding the size of the college were equally important in all of this. And they, it's clear that talent comes in every shape and size, every background and experience from every corner of this country and around the world. And the university was not drawing on all of that talent before and being able to provide the financial resources for people and to be able to signal to students all over the world that if you can gain entrance to this extraordinary university, you will be taken care of financially in a way that this, you'll never be burdened by that is a 
huge deal. I think that signal in itself is giant. But the other, I just wanted to make one piece about, one, one, one note about the size of the college. I really worry about too many of the colleges that have extraordinary resources, intellectual resources, financial resources, and are staying so small um, at a time. We, yesterday we talked a little bit about the social contract between universities and society in the sense that they should be opening those doors and educating more people. Why shouldn't they have access to that kind of education? You know, the, 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 the growth here, the number of alums, the number of people who have an impact in the world because of their Chicago education is growing exponentially over time. That's important, but it's also important for the university and the contract that it has more broadly being tiny, being a place that is really not allowing people to f have the full benefit of this education, that's bad for society in my view. And I think there's gonna be a reckoning on that for many, and not, this is not about Caltech, by the way, which has a, <laughs> uh, has a different kind of mission, just to be clear. I'm sorry, I could feel something, I could feel some heat coming and I just wanted to acknowledge that. But that, I think that there's a, there's a piece of this that just is gonna be, for some places, is gonna be a reckoning. And I think that there's gonna be a lot of people that say, you know, there's, we, we're already having many challenges in terms of the public perception of our universities, some of which I think we deserve and we've earned over time. Um, but one of the ways to actually change that is to actually be more generous in terms of educating these incredible students who are so deserving. And the university here, I think, has been a, um, a, real, a, a, a real kind of leader in that, and it's gonna be important for others to do that as well. I, I think as in higher education, we're labeled, or at least in the leading research universities, uh, we're labeled with uh, the pejorative term elite. And uh, this is a, a consistent theme, I think, through American history, actually, but it's particularly bad now. And I think one of the ways we can deal with that is not to stop being elite in the sense of wanting to uh, provide an education uh, that addresses societal needs through training incredibly creative and talented individuals from every background and perspective, but rather to make sure that people understand it's a level playing field, mm -hmm. that they have the opportunity of access on mm -hmm. an equal basis. I mean, I think people understand that they may not play second base for the Cubs, uh, and because there are other people who do it better, but they feel that if they went and uh, do whatever you do, now we're way out of my range, <laughs> to become a successful baseball player, um, that they would make it on the basis of their talent. And, and I think the Odyssey program, getting back to your question, uh, contributes to this quite a bit. And the fact that uh, University of Chicago is neat blind, Caltech's neat blind, uh, there are only about 60 uh, institutions in the country which, which do that. If we can move more to the notion that no matter what your circumstances, if you have the wherewithal to benefit from and contribute to an institution like the University of Chicago, we'll make it possible. I'm gonna jump in a little bit if I may and just say, you know, I actually think and in conversations even, you know, recently with with John around, you know, what is the right size of the college. And I just wanna go back to part of the founding uh, concepts of the university, one of which has to do with the, um, this idea of, I mean, you know, it may sound hokey, but this idea of unity of knowledge, the fact that, and that's, that's what leads us to the core, right? This notion that people should learn to think from all of the different perspectives. If you actually think about many aspects of what makes the University of Chicago so, so distinctive and so successful, it's actually a relatively compact place. You can get from one side to the other very easily. It's actually not that big. Of, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a, the size of a Caltech, but it's also not the size of, uh, let's say, uh, Ann Arbor, uh, of University of Michigan. So, so you know, the, the, it's, uh, it, it's got a size at which the, the, in, for example, the college, the faculty from across the university really can get to know each other and work together and build things of very high quality. And as you think about scaling to a different size, at some point that becomes lost. And much of the discussion is around where is that change in kind? 
it wasn't at 2,800 because we already knew, for example, all the graduate programs were started. You know, so so the, this size that we have, I think, is actually a perfectly appropriate one. I, I do think Odyssey matters a lot, and we're only part, you know, and I think it was just foundationally changing for the university, and, and we're still on a journey. <laughs> we're on our own Odyssey to make that, you know, to, to, to really make that access even, even greater. But to this point around the disconnect of society and the universities, I do think this university in particular has a lot to offer in terms of helping society to address its greatest challenges. And, and to the extent that we take on that engaged role, uh, I think our, our, uh, we will be viewed widely as the great partners of our society in, in solving problems. And that's the answer for us more than trying to address the, you know, almost impossible for us to address issue of the vast number of students who need to be educated. That's a different role for other parts of the ecosystem. If I may add, like the Odyssey program allows access to the university education. And there are other programs of first generation, no barriers, and expanded to attract rural students and veteran students. But I think the college has been very, very careful as they are admitting these students to ensure there is a support environment, a system for them. They are slightly different, their experience are different, and they need a slightly different um, kind of support. And I remember those conversations with John in terms of when the new programs come in play, how can we put things in place so that these students would not only come in and enjoy their first year, but they would leave here with a certificate, with a diploma at the end of their journey here. And so I think that is hugely important that just really recently we talked about sort of, you know, how to address at-risk students, what are the at-risk students, and how do we have more of a personal touch in terms of checking in on them to ensure they really make this journey a complete one. And, and I think that is really distinctive of what the college has been doing and has been trying to put in place. Well, this seems like an opportune moment to turn to the audience to ask any questions that you might have. Um, there's so much accumulated experience on the panel. I'm sure you have many questions and there are people with mics in the background, so just raise a hand, and I see a hand up front. If you wait for the mic, we'll be all, I'll be able to hear. Thanks for your lovely remarks and tributes to John. I'm Martha Merritt. I worked with John for 10 years, and I wanted to pose a question based on actually more explicitly working for him than the members of the panel. Um, so talking about John's deanly repertoire, there are a couple of techniques that I think we all benefit from. tell. <laughs> and one of them is calling things a pilot program, which many of you have mentioned. So if you're trying to do something that's impossible, and everyone says, oh, we can't do that, whatever university you're working for, John would say, let's call it a pilot program. And that made everybody feel like the stakes were less, and you're just trying something out. And that is the nature of many of the entrenched and wonderful programs that you've all mentioned. But I also appreciated the trust he put in his staff, and many of you around the room started working for John and have moved on to other positions. Um, he would say to me, for example, why don't you go along to this unmentioned part of the sentence, notoriously difficult program, and propose a new study abroad initiative? And you'd go do it, and all hell would break loose, and in a year, there'd be a new study abroad program. Why don't you go along to David Green and talk about a new dorm? difficult, difficult, and the beautiful thing that you helped to create, David. And then, you know, sending people forth into the university more widely as voices of the new messages, or the world. Why don't you go along to the center in Paris and resolve that French labor dispute? <laughs> <laughs> so, the subtlety you've mentioned is very much part of John's repertoire, but there's also a sledgehammer that came out twice in the 10 years I worked for him. And that was incredibly impressive too. All that restraint, all that withholding, and then whack. And probably everyone in this room can name those two sledgehammer events. So in this sense, I wanted to ask the members of the panel if there are techniques that you not only admired but learned from and have incorporated in your own disparate careers as you either left Chicago and or still are here 
that help you deal probably with the college itself in some ways. So who would like to uh, <laughs> describe how you're, learn how you're using what you learned from or at the hands of Dean Boyer <laughs> in your current position? I just love that idea of taking staff and just throwing them into the fire. That yeah. sounds like, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I thought you'd like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, I learned that all the time. You go do it. Yeah. Let's go. I think, John, I think one thing I would just say about, that, about John's, that, that his, that you're right, he's got a kind of both um, subtle and forceful in ways that are pretty compelling. And one of the, in, not, but I appreciated about John is that he, he didn't, he, it wasn't about credit to him, which is one of the most powerful things. It was like, let's get this done and figure out how to get it done. And it doesn't have to shine a light on me. It's actually absolutely a blast that we're shining a light on him today. But that was not always where he needed to be. And by the, by the way, he gets to write the history of it anyway, so he gets to decide what that looks like. So I also, that, and just to that, to that last piece on the technique, I think that both from the longevity of everything that you've done, John, but the writing, the history, you always kept a long view. And that, I think, from a, from a strategy standpoint, from a commitment standpoint, you have to be able to make change all along the way. But if you ever lose sight of the long view, everything else collapses. Yeah, so, so I, I, I would add the uh, clarity of purpose. Yeah. So when, when we went uh, through the budget cutting after uh, 2008, uh, in the provost's office, I think I held 100 meetings with, with the deans, literally 100. We went through various rounds, where, and then we would all get together after each round, John's nodding. It was, it was rather, rather painful, but, mm -hmm. but, but I think every, I hope that everybody felt that their concerns were being heard, if not even if we didn't do what they wanted us to do, but that we were legitimately listening. And, and I was very impressed um, about John in particular in the way, uh, of course, John understood the university very well, but also the place of the college in it and what had to be protected in the college, even as we were forced to make certain adjustments this way. And, and, and I think being able to distill uh, what really matters, what are the principles that you want to protect, to never give up. As you know, John never gives up in that way in terms of pushing it when it's important that way, but understanding ex the ex exigencies uh, that force uh, compromise on issues that are not the moral purpose at stake. And, and, and I think that lesson is good for all of us mm -hmm. as, as we think about uh, dealing with trials and tribulations as you go ahead. Mm -hmm. and, and thinking of the college as a unifying force across the university that's come up a couple of different times and you know, thinking about the low walls at the University of Chicago that are, you know, for those of us who've spent time at other institutions, it really is true. The campus is, has physically compact space, but also has fewer barriers to collaboration across units than lots of other universities that shall not be named. And, and that is the college plays a crucial role in that and coming from the vantage point of a professional school where I think in a lot of universities, there is no opportunity or desire for the faculty of the professional schools to teach college students and be integrated with the faculty in related areas, approaching problems from multiple perspectives across the university. And, and the college and the core set up that ethos that then allows the university community to draw on the talent across the whole university. And I know that at the Harris School, our faculty and our graduate students benefited from that as much as the undergraduates who were in the public mm -hmm. policy major. It was really a wonderful resource mm -hmm. to attract and amplify talent across the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I see two more questions. Respond to this question. Let's start with the response to this question. I apologize for taking the discussion from the sacred to the profane, but I think it's worth observing that John uses these same skills in fundraising. <laughs> and they're very, just as they are on the campus. He will invite you to lunch, invite you to dinner. The 
progress will take place slowly over time. You don't even realize that the heat is <laughs> under the kettle. And eventually, when he makes a specific proposal, it's very thoughtful. And it's, uh, there's a lot of humility in his approach. And in particular, I remember that what he proposed to us was that the funding could go to a different part of the university, it didn't have to come to the college, as long as it created internships for college students, he was happy. And uh, I hate to say these things to you because you might use these techniques, but <laughs> they've been great for the university. Yeah, keep that stuff coming. Uh, we'll do this. <laughs> yes. I believe someone mentioned an unnamed dorm. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I want to ask a question about John's stewardship of another uh, University of Chicago norm, which is the norm of academic rigor. So in the dark, backward, and abysm of time before John was dean, <laughs> David Brooks was in the college, and he used to write a column for the Maroon. He was funnier then. <laughs> One of his columns was called Giving Good Intellectual Weight, and it was about um, a visit he made to the master of the college, this is a matter of record, it's in the Maroons, so it was Jamie Redfield. You approached Jamie Redfield about studying abroad, and Jamie Redfield explained to him that um, the University of Chicago didn't consider study abroad a good idea because you really couldn't afford to spend a quarter away from our curriculum. You, the loss would be too great. And that in any case, he said, travel, he found, tended to be intellectually thinning. <laughs> <laughs> So David Brooks's column was about, this was, you can date this because it was the time of Arnold Schwarzenegger's pumping iron. It was about this column in the reg, you know, pumping up. This is the situation John came into when he started to build our study abroad program, which I didn't realize had grown to 4,000 experiences. So somehow he managed to maintain or evolve, I think I want to say evolve, the university's notion of academic rigor as he proliferated these, these study abroad programs. And I'm here to tell you that these study abroad programs are not rigorous in the same way that our classrooms on campus are. Right? They're not. But they, I'm, I, I love them. I think they're great. I think they're good for the university. But it's an example of how you have to evolve a notion of rigor or supplement it to produce something like where we are now. So my question for everybody here, and many people want to take it on, I think this is even harder than Martha's question, is what is our new evolved notion of academic rigor, um, shepherded partly by all the things that John did in the college? So I don't know if anyone would like to take on you know, the question of the enduring value of rigor here and also the um, really special nature of study of what study abroad looks like at U Chicago versus lots of other places, which is different. I think we have a very different model for study abroad. Um, we actually want to make sure that they have the University of Chicago type of education. We do fly our faculty for that three weeks compressed sort of one quarter experience there. So I, I think that the innovation that is put in John has always tried to optimize uh, the experience for the students and really make sure that they get the academic rigor, but also in, in our current time be trained as a global citizen. Um, and so the optimization goes in various form, right? So we had the Paris 1.0 um, that has served the students very well. And then, you know, we will be expecting Paris 2.0, our center, to be opening uh, the summer um, of 2024, whereby not only is it going to be a Paris center, but it's going to be a hub for you know, North Africa and as well as other nations uh, in Europe. The similar thing for Hong Kong, Hong Kong is not really just a location for Hong Kong, but is also a hub. And John was really trying to optimize with the 
September term with a, the civilization term that I talked about, but also to create a, a winter term for the economic students to be there. And so he's always thinking about sort of how to extend the experience to be complementary to the academic experience, but without compromising the academic experience. So, so that's, at least from my perspective, that is really innovating and bringing our students to the current time for what a vigorous education um, is like. So, so Jim, I, I always love your questions, <laughs> and uh, so I'm not sure I can really engage it deeply, but just two quick responses. Uh, first, I think what characterizes the University of Chicago education in a lot of ways, or, or an act of uh, scholarship, is to actually engage with primary sources. We don't want to hear what other people have to say, at least at the start. Uh, we don't want a derivative response, but actually to understand the textual context and the, well, the, the whole context, but often represented through text. I think you can look at study abroad in some ways as a way to get closer to primary sources, to understand the way that that thought developed in a culture and environment where it is. So I think in that sense, it's consonant with what we want to do, although obviously we'd have less control over who's teaching and the nature of the exchange. Uh, the second minor comment I'd make is that I'm very much struck that I can come here, anybody can come back here, and, and say rigorous inquiry, and everybody nods and knows what you're talking about. That is not true everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not making a comment about Caltech, but, but I, do travel the, I do travel the hustings a fair amount, and uh, it's something very special that we take for granted. But I think it speaks to, to your point about if you want to be rigorous, you can't be constantly, ex you have to be constantly querying yourself about whether you're upholding those values, but you can't constantly be bringing people along and explaining where you're trying to go. Mm. Uh, and, and I think University of Chicago is in a good place that way. Mm. Can I add one quick thing to that? I think, actually think that some of the challenges to traditional notions of rigor right now are actually going to be sort of fundamental in the students who are coming into our campuses at this point. So when you look at the issues of sort of neurodiversity in our students and how they're learning in different ways and what they bring, brilliant students, but learning in very different ways, and many of them in a traditional environment um, struggling, but with different types of accommodations as we're all seeing now at a level that we've never seen before, can continue to thrive. How does that affect what we think of as rigor? When we think about what's happened with students coming through the pandemic and what they lost for a period of two years and the challenges that that brings when we see the rise of mental health issues in 18 to 22 year olds at levels we've never seen before in ways that are sort of deeply frightening and concerning and thinking about the notions of rigor in that environment and what it means for students right now um, who are facing all kinds of challenges in ways that I think that many generations before did not um, have at the at the sort of breadth and depth that we're seeing right now. These are some of the things I think that are actually going to actually bring some real tensions around these issues. I know we're feeling it at my institution right now, how to work through that and the kind of having a really challenging curriculum and having a very demanding uh, set of work for students to be able to do and then trying to think about how do you deal when if there are 5% of your students who have accommodations is one thing. If it's 25%, if it's 50%, it's entirely different again. And so I think there's gonna to have to be some shifts in how we're thinking about teaching, how we're thinking about a whole range of things without giving up the things that are most important about the kind of deep learning and, and the real, what, what rigor means in its true essence, but it might mean some changes in, in pedagogy and other things. You know, I wanted to jump in and say, I, I, you know, I'd go slightly almost the other way and just express my deep optimism. I, you know, we have this uh, evolution in the world right now where these um, new techniques for sharing information are becoming available through machine learning and AI and all those kinds of things. And they're going to do all kinds of things that are uh, complex and we need to grapple with it. Um, but I, if I think about a student who um, suddenly has those tools available to them, 
and yet at the same time is able to go back to the text-based learning, to the discussions in a, in a room. Now, think about what power they're going to be able to just access information in completely different ways, and yet still get all these ways of asking questions that come from how, you know, how we educate people um, in the small classroom settings. Uh, I have optimism that, that this next generation of students that we'll be educating are going to bring a level of rigor that just, you know, it was hard for many others to have because getting to that base level of information in the first place was just so darn hard. So, you know, if anything, they're going to be able to climb up faster and go further. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for us in this next period to, you know, think hard about what that will mean for this next generation of students. Well, one of the things to ask about rigor is <clears throat> what are the results of the rigor that we are claiming to embody here. And what was wonderful to me coming here was meeting lots of Chicago alumni. And without exception, if one asked them, what did the University of Chicago mean to you? They would answer instantly, taught me how to think. And that seems to me like a brilliant test to apply to anything you might be likely to want to try. Will this program or this effort be likely to contribute to the likelihood that the students who come out of it will say, it taught me how to think? Um, and when you spread that across the whole institution, you create a remarkable environment, which hardly any other institution can dream of. Mm -hmm. So I think we have time for one more, or two more questions, because I saw two hands, one and two. Oh, sorry. Only two. Hi. Um, as a graduate 30 years ago um, and a current parent of a freshman, um, I bring it now down to a more specific question. And David, you brought up how much the university has seen in positive build around um, and the sense of community and how well Hyde Park is doing uh, on its own due to the university being the heartbeat of it. Um, we talked about the size of a college and this is, what is the optimal size of a college and this one in particular. Um, and then we talked about how great the student life has been. Uh, many of John's programs have changed dramatically. Like the school that my son goes to now is nothing like the one me and my wife went to 30 years ago. Um, and kudos to you, John, for doing that, and David for uh, all you've done, and all of you. But um, it brings me to a very specific question, and I think I'm going to put President uh, Olivasados on the spot here. We hear, partially on the outside, but you know, I guess with one foot in the door still, um, that the positive residential life that exists now is such a success that there is momentum or at least a call to extend it and take the two years and why not turn it into three? Um, how could that happen physically and is there a lot of momentum behind it or is that a priority to discuss that uh, currently and near future? We're certainly looking at it. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons to want to consider having um, more, um, uh, more housing and to continuing the, uh, I, I think what we've learned so far is that uh, when residential life is done well, it helps build community and it helps people to learn better. Uh, and so it has a lot of benefits. And we're certainly taking a close look at where we could build more, more housing uh, for students. Uh, and my sense from talking with students is that there'll always be a tension around this. Obviously, there's a moment uh, that the students experience where being able to go out uh, into their own um, living uh, with some friends in an apartment or something nearby is a, is a growth experience. There's no question. But it's a trade-off. And we may be able to handle that also by just offering um, the opportunity for those who want it, because a lot of people do, actually. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm certainly, we're, we're discussing it, you know, pretty deeply at this point, just trying to get what are the options. I would just say that we were helped a little bit by having residence halls where toilets were literally exploding. <laughs> so 
when there was like porcelain you know, shrapnel my, going everywhere? My, my uh, first year as a student, I was um, <laughs> gifted with a plaster shower uh, in the Shortland. You know? Yeah, so that, that sometimes, you know, necessity gets you really moving on things. Uh, was, I, was, I, I'm just happy this is not the last question. <laughs> If, if we can get a last question that's not going to allude to exploding toilets, that might be good. We want to end on, a, um, on the exploding toilets. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, John is a, is a historian, and it's hard to think of another historian in higher education who has overseen such radical change. And, you know, e each of us has been the recipient, uh, you know, annually of these booklets and and so forth and it, I remember getting them the, the very first one and thinking what is this um, and looking and starting to read and there are tales of um, well-meaning and sometimes ill-meaning and mendacious administrators in the history of the uh, of the university um, but they have licensed a kind of radical change. You could imagine that there would be certain kinds of historians who might point to the traditions and, the, and emphasize the continuities, but all of John's histories are really about these kind of change makers in our university. And so I guess I wanted to testify to that, but also just maybe invite you to say a few words about what you've learned from John as a historian. <laughs> He, <laughs> That's awestruck silence. <laughs> he is very crafty. His use of <laughs> no example is random. <laughs> no, no example is random. <laughs> but, but also, you know, I think when you read John's books, one of the things you realize, of course, is that the details matter, but so do the long-term trends. And both of those things, you know, it's, it's the small moves that make up ultimately the larger ones over time. And I think you get a real feel for that when you read John's books and you bring some of these things to life, that paying attention to those things and kind of consistently working at those things that will just impact the university over time. And, you know, after, after a period of time, after 30 years, you can look back and see just an enormous set of progress and change and positive developments that have happened, but it happened through all of those conversations, through all of that work on the small details. And that's something that's so important for all of us to remember. Well, and I think we've heard uh, today so many examples of how transformative the Boyer era has been for the college, for the university, for all of us here. And I know I'm so grateful to our panelists who are illustrious in so many ways of helping bring that to light and share their experiences. And please join me in thanking them for this wonderful session. <laughs>